Welcome to Ancient Philosophy Lecture 20. This lecture will close out our course on Plato and Aristotle, so I hope you guys have enjoyed this. We're going to focus in this final lecture on Aristotle's logic and his philosophy of mathematics. So let's go ahead and jump in. So we're going to start off talking about Aristotle's logic. The reading for this section comes from Prior Analytics, Book 1, Chapters 1 through 7, and Chapter 23, and then Posterior Analytics, Book 1, Chapters 1 through 4, and Book 2, Chapter 19. Aristotle is credited with discovering and formulating formal logic. In his book, Sophistical Refutations, Aristotle talks uncharacteristically of the importance of his inquiry. So he says, so he says of the present inquiry, which is on logic, it was not the case that part of the work had been thoroughly done before while part had not. Nothing existed at all. On the subject of syllogism, we had nothing else of an earlier date to speak of at all. So Aristotle here views himself as creating this system of formal logic. So I think this is really fascinating. So I think you'll really enjoy seeing what Aristotle is up to in this system of logic. Let's begin with the idea that we're interested in inquiry. We're interested in coming to know things about the world. Aristotle says that every person has a desire to know. Every person has this desire to understand the world. And we can start with some information, but then we want to tease out that information and come to know other things. And so argument is a way of extending knowledge. Given that we have some information, what must be true given that information? Aristotle is interested in focusing on arguments from premises that are known without argument. So what we'll talk about in a minute is that Aristotle wants to start with this idea that we have immediate knowledge of certain claims, and then we want to use argument to be able to extend that immediate knowledge to things that are not immediately known. So let's get some background here of how Aristotle's logic is focused on extending knowledge from immediately known propositions. So look at the posterior analytics, book one, chapters one through four, and book two, chapter 19. So in chapter three of book one, Aristotle gives the regress argument. It is important to read in context, and so that's why I have the chapters 1 through 4 of book 1, and then in book 2, chapter 19, Aristotle reflects some more about immediate knowledge. So, begin with the idea that some truths are intelligible only on account of other more basic intelligible truths. That there's this relation of dependence between claims that are known. For example, take the theory of evolution. It's reasonable to believe that this theory is true, but the reason that theory is reasonable is because there are other more basic truths, truths that are known prior to the theory of evolution. If you look at Darwin's original book on the origin of species, you can see at the end of the book that Darwin is arguing for his theory of evolution on the basis of observed facts that he has gathered and collected. So we can see that some claims are reasonable because other claims are reasonable. Aristotle investigates, if that's true, how should we think about these dependence relations? So suppose we start with a claim that is reasonable only if another claim is reasonable. And we think about the dependence relations between those claims. We can have one of three options, either this chain of reasons will eventually give out in something that's immediately reasonable. So for example, we can say P1 holds, or P1 is reasonable, where this is a particular claim, and we ask, well, what makes that claim reasonable? Well, there's some other claim, P2, and that makes P1 reasonable. And then we can ask, well, what makes P2 reasonable? And suppose there's another claim. Well, eventually, one option is that this chain of reasons stops with a claim that is immediately reasonable, that it doesn't need to be defended by another claim. So that's one option. Another option is that every claim is supported by another claim in an endless regress. And that's the picture we have here. P1 is reasonable because P2 is reasonable, because P3 is reasonable, because P4 is reasonable, and P4 itself is reasonable because P5 is reasonable, and this continues on forever. Now, in posterior analytics, Aristotle argues that this doesn't generate reasonability for P1 because the regress never ends, and so it never actually becomes reasonable to believe P1. We can think here about Aristotle's theory of deliberation, and the idea is that you have to get back to an action 
that you can do in order for deliberation to transfer the desire for the goal to the desire for the means. And with an endless regress of reasons, what you see here is that the reasonableness of any particular claim never transfers back to the original claim. A third option is that each claim is supported by another claim in a big circle of reasoning. So here we would see these chain of reasonings as eventually looping back. So you would get to some claims, say P5, and you would inquire into why P5 is reasonable, and the thought is that P5 is reasonable because P1 is reasonable. And Aristotle says here that it's far too easy to prove anything that way that this amounts to saying that P1 is reasonable because P1 is reasonable. But if we're starting with a claim that's not immediately evident, then this doesn't actually provide any evidence that P1 is true. So the regress argument functions in Aristotle's overall logic to show that there needs to be immediately reasonable claims. And then we can use logic to infer other claims on the basis of what is immediately reasonable. So at the end of posterior analytics, Aristotle says you cannot understand anything through a demonstration unless you know the primitive immediate principles. This is the conclusion of the regress argument. Demonstration doesn't accomplish anything until you know the premises from which the demonstration proceeds. And this eventually has to ground out in immediately reasonable premises. So logic Aristotle conceives is what enables us to relate immediately known principles to other principles. So let's introduce some terminology. The first term that I want you to learn is the notion of validity. So this is a term that applies to arguments, and we can say that an argument is valid if and only if, when its premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So we have here a very simple example of modus ponens, if A, then B, A, therefore B. We can think about this and we say, is there any way for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false? And the premises say that if A is true, then B is true, and then it says that A is true. And so it follows, it's a logical consequence of the premises, that B itself is true. Consider another example. We have this simple argument that blank is a square, so blank is a rectangle. We can see that regardless of what we put in for the blank, that there's no way we could put something in for the blank that turns out to make that claim true, that is we put a square in the blank, that then would turn out that whatever we put in in the premise makes the conclusion false because all squares are rectangles, just very simple. Validity is an important property. If we're assured that an argument is valid, then we're assured that a true premise isn't going to take us to a false conclusion. But in addition to validity, a good argument requires that one can see that the inference is valid. There are very complicated valid inferences that their validity just isn't discernible. And so what Aristotle is concerned to do is not only to isolate valid inferences, but to isolate inferences that are easy to see their validity. These inferences Aristotle calls perfect. So we now understand the notion of a valid argument. Any argument that isn't valid is invalid. So for example, take this very simple argument. Premise one is that UA is in Tuscaloosa, and the conclusion is that you are listening to this lecture. So notice that the premise is true, and the conclusion is true. But this argument isn't valid. And the reason that it's not valid is that it's possible for there to be an argument that has the same form where the premise is true and the conclusion is false. Another way to say this is that there's nothing about that form of the argument in which the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premise. So in order to grasp this notion of an argument's form, consider the following argument. All bachelors are unmarried men. All unmarried men are mortal. So all bachelors are mortal. When we think about this argument, you can see that if the premises are true, if it's true that all bachelors are unmarried men, and it's true that unmarried men are mortal, then it has to be true that all bachelors are mortal. And in fact, there's nothing special about this argument that depends on the fact that we're talking about bachelors and unmarried men or, or unmarried men that are mortal. We can take those referring terms out of the argument and replace them with variables, and then we get the following argument. All A are B, 
all B or C, so all C or A. What we did is we took out the term bachelor, we replaced it with a variable A, and we took out the term unmarried men, and we replaced it with B, and then we took out the term mortal, replaced it with C, and we get this argument. And we can see that this argument is valid in virtue of its form. This is to say that there's no way we could uniformly substitute terms in for A, B, and C such that we'd end up where we'd have true premises and a false conclusion. So the notion of a formally valid argument is an important notion because it gives us a confidence to know that if our argument is formally valid, then there's no way in which true premises will take us to a false conclusion. And so it gives us a very secure way of extending our knowledge of the world. Now, some arguments are valid, but they're not formally valid. So consider the argument x is a square, so x is a rectangle. There's nothing about the form of the argument that makes it the case that if the premise is true, the conclusion has to be true. One way to see this is if we take out the referring terms and replace them with variables, we would have x is a, so x is b. But we can come up with examples where x is a and x is b, but the premise is true and the conclusion is false. Consider, for example, that we just switch the terms around. So x is a rectangle, where we substitute that in for a, and x is a square, where we substitute that in for b. Well then, we could have the premise to be true and the conclusion to be false. Some rectangles are not squares. So Aristotle rightly focuses on the importance of formally valid arguments. They're arguments that give us this kind of security when we go about extending our knowledge. So we've seen that formal validity is important because it gives us an assurance that if we start off with known premises and we have a formally valid argument, then we're guaranteed that the conclusion is true. What we want to do is develop a system of inference so that we can determine what arguments are formally valid and what arguments are not formally valid. So we can develop an axiomatic theory, a theory that separates out the axioms and the definitions and then the things that are proven on the basis of those axioms and definitions. Aristotle's goal was to have an axiomatic theory for arguments. In this case, we would have a rigorous argument that makes every assumption explicit. If this is the case where we have made every assumption explicit and we have a formally valid argument from axioms to a theorem, then we can be assured that it is a genuine theorem, that indeed the claim is true. So we want to take an example of this, look at Euclid's axiomatic theory of geometry and his first proof, which surprisingly turns out to be invalid. Now Euclid would have lived around the time of Aristotle's grandson, so they were not contemporaries, but it's commonly thought that Euclid was drawing upon existing information when he created the elements. Many of these theorems and much of Euclid's axiomatic system and theorems may well have come from Pythagoras, which lived, you know, before Socrates and that, you know, of course, before Aristotle. The example that I'm going to look at comes from a discussion by Jonathan Lear in his excellent book, Aristotle, The Desire to Understand. So Euclid's axiomatic system, you can see up there on the right-hand side. So the postulates or the axioms are the following. One, to draw a straight line from any point to any point. Two, to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. Three, to describe a circle with any center and any distance. Four, that right angles are equal to one another. Fifth, that if a straight line falling on two lines, make the interior angle on the same side less than two right angles. The straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which the angles have less than the two right angles. This is known as Euclid's parallel postulate. And then he provides some definitions and some common notions. And then book one, proposition one, is to prove that on any given finite straight line, you can construct an equilateral triangle. So here's the way the proof works. So first what we do is we draw a circle with center A and radius AB. Next, we draw a separate circle that has as its center B and radius AB. Both of these steps we can do by the axioms, and so you can look at the axioms. And then next, we draw a line from A to the point C where the two circles intersect, and draw a line B 
to see. The axioms allow us to draw lines between any two points. And now, note that each line that we drew is the same length because it's the same radius as the circles. And so Euclid thinks we can see that the triangle must be an equilateral triangle. That is, the triangle has all equal sides. Now, this is an example of something that can seem like a rigorous proof, but the actual argument is invalid. So note that there is nothing about the axioms that allows us to infer that the two circles actually intersect at a point. So there's nothing about the axioms that gives us the existence of point C. You may say, well, just look at the pictures. It's obvious that the two points intersect. This is exactly the problem that Aristotle is trying to avoid. He's trying to describe a formal system of reasoning where we don't have to appeal to pictures as heuristics and we don't have to appeal to a notion of obviousness. Now you may have realized that if you've done some geometry in college that if you're dealing with alternative geometries like Ramanian geometry or Lobovchevskian geometry that if space is curved that the two circles may not intersect at a point. But this is something that is difficult to notice and this is why it is so important for there to be formal systems of reasoning where we make each assumption explicit because what we want to do is we want to discover important facts about the world where we're not smuggling in ideas that aren't themselves present in the information that we're reasoning from. So how can you prevent such errors from occurring? Well the idea behind formal logic is that we can abstract away from meanings and focus just on the form of the inference. Aristotle's logic attempted to accomplish this. So just a brief background real quick. So Aristotle took as fundamental for logic the sentence that can be analyzed in terms of subject and predicate. And then we could have four separate propositions. We could have a universal affirmative proposition, all S or P. We could have a universal negative proposition, no S or P. We can have a particular affirmative proposition, some s or p, and a particular negative proposition, some s or not p. So you can see this terminology in the prior analytics from the reading that we have there. So Aristotle developed a series of syllogisms that he found were valid. I just want to look at one. The classic name for this is Barber. So this is the form that all a or b, all b or c, all a or c. The first figure, from what you see here on the picture, are the perfect syllogisms. So the term Barbara, what we look at is the three vowels, and those tell us the form. So, so the three vowels in Barbara are A, 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 so that tells us the form, that it's combining two premises that are universal affirmative, in this case all B or C, all A or B, and then we have a universal affirmative conclusion that all A or C. Now the second figure syllogisms are Im imperfect argument. They can be perfected by transforming the premises into premises that are of the form of the first figure. And so these inferences Aristotle thinks are more difficult to note that they're valid. Once they're transformed into first figure arguments, you can immediately see that they're valid. And here too, what we see is the vowels tell us what the form of the premises are. The first letter tells us which argument in the first figure perfects the arguments in the second and the third figure. Cesare, for example, will be perfected by Clarin, the second argument in the second figure. Aristotle's logic, much like his biology, was almost taught for over 2,000 years. It wasn't until the rise of modern logic with Frege and Russell in the late 19th and early 20th century that we began to develop a more sophisticated system of logic. So hats off to Aristotle for his amazing accomplishment. So I want to close now by looking at Aristotle's philosophy of math because what we see here is a very clear contrast between Plato's philosophy of math and Aristotle's. So the reading here is Physics, Book 2, Chapter 2, and Metaphysics, Book 13, Chapters 2 through 3. So the mathematician proves truths about spheres, triangles, cubes, and numbers. But there aren't numbers in nature, and there aren't perfect geometrical shapes in nature. If we draw a circle on the board, that's not going to be a perfect circle. It's not going to have a constant radius. 
all around. There are going to be little imperfections. And so we might wonder how we should understand these mathematical truths that mathematicians prove. In particular, we can ask how we should understand the referring terms in these claims. So take a very simple claim that a circle has an area of pi r squared. How should we understand the term circle there? What does that refer to? If there aren't perfect circles in nature, then this is a claim that if it were to refer to actual circles in nature, and there aren't any perfect circles, then it would be false. Any particular circle that we pick doesn't have an area of pi r squared. It has some more complicated formula describing its area. Plato thought that numbers and geometrical shapes exist in an ideal realm, and mathematical terms refer to them. So for Plato, he can recognize that this claim, a circle has an area of pi r squared, is true in virtue of the fact that circle refers to this ideal circle. This is known as a Platonist view of math, and it faces two questions. First, how do we have access to these items? These ideal objects aren't in space and time. They're not things that we pick up with our senses, and so what gives us access to these ideal objects? Second claim is how math applies to the physical world. When we prove certain claims about the volume of an object and what happens when the pressure of the object changes, we're using mathematical results to prove things about the physical world. And if this is the case of claims that are true about ideal objects and then they're being applied to non-ideal objects, we want to be told a little bit more about how that exactly is supposed to work. So Aristotle is bothered by those problems and he proposes a different view about mathematics. So on Aristotle's view, mathematics is about the changing world, that there's no platonic realm of these ideal objects. So he writes in Physics, Book 2, Chapter 2, he says the next point to consider is how the mathematician differs from the student of nature. For natural bodies contain surfaces, volumes, lines, and points, and these are the subject matter of mathematics. Now the mathematician, though he too treats of these things, does not treat them as the limits of natural bodies, nor does he consider the attributes indicated as the attributes of those bodies. This is why he separates them for in thought, they are separable from change, and it makes no difference, nor does any falsity result if they are separated. So Aristotle's thought here is that physical objects in the world of change have mathematical properties that we can think about, and we can separate out those mathematical properties of objects by thought. For example, when we consider the claim that a circle's area is pi r squared, Aristotle would say that we don't need to refer to an ideal circle for this to be true. Rather, we can focus on some physical objects that are circular and then think about that property that they have. And when we prove that a circle's area is pi r squared, we're proving something about properties that physical objects actually have. So it's important for Aristotle's view that mathematical geometrical properties are indeed properties of objects but they're not separate from the matter of the objects. That is, they're not physically separable. Rather, they can be separated in thought, and it's thought that allows us to prove these claims. And in virtue of reasoning in a formally good way, we come to prove these claims of math. Aristotle's view has some plausibility to it because geometrical properties of objects seem to be, indeed, properties of objects. We can say that a ball is spherical or a cube is cubic shape. There's a problem with extending Aristotle's philosophy of geometry to his philosophy of arithmetic. And the problem is this, it's that while shape is a physical property of objects, number is not a property of physical objects. So an object can be simultaneously one book, two stories, 30 pages, a certain number of molecules, a certain number of atoms, and so on. So note the contrast again with geometrical properties. So consider again just a cube. We can easily think it has a definite shape, and so it could be cubic, but suppose it's composed by putting together Lego blocks. We could still consider it one cube, we could consider it many blocks, we can consider it many molecules. And so to apply number to it, we have to apply 
a concept to it that helps organize what it is that we're talking about. This is a problem that was addressed by Frege in the late part of the 19th century. This is a problem for Aristotle that his philosophy of geometry doesn't fit well with his philosophy of arithmetic, and that's because of the special nature of numbers. So a strength of the Platonic view is that numbers really do exist, but a strength of Aristotle's view is that math is knowable via perception and abstraction. So the philosophy of mathematics is still an ongoing area. There are still debates between positions influenced by Plato and positions influenced by Aristotle. So I hope this is a helpful introduction to philosophy of mathematics and to Aristotle's response to Plato and how he's thinking about mathematical truths. Okay, so we've reached the end of this course. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I have enjoyed reading and talking about Plato and Aristotle. I've enjoyed your comment, and I look forward to talking to you in person about Plato and Aristotle when this pandemic is over. I want to encourage you to keep reading. We were not able to discuss Plato's Symposium, an amazing dialogue on the nature of of love, and Plato's Timaeus, which is Plato's creation story. And it provides some of Plato's anthropology and how he's thinking about the human body and medicine. For Aristotle, I'd encourage you to check out his rhetoric and his poetics. We talked briefly about his poetics at the end of our discussion of Plato's Republic, where Aristotle provides a more compelling view of poetry. So if you guys continue to learn and enjoy thinking about ancient philosophy, 